Well, today I have a special guest here with me, Melissa Ferguson, and I'm going to let her share some of the particulars of her story in just a little bit. But before I do, all of us knows Christmas looks so different this year, um, and yet in the midst of it, we're still to live this time with a unique sense of joy and expectancy that God still wants to move in our lives. He still wants to give us peace and hope in trying circumstances. And I think that Melissa's story is going to give all of us today a unique insight into that. Uh, Melissa's been in my small group for, I don't know how many years? Uh, uh, three, four? Several years. Yes. <laughs> and um, every time she just has some amazing things to share. Um, and so welcome, Melissa. So glad you're here today. Thank you so much for having me. Absolutely. Uh, Melissa, would you tell us just a little bit about the journey that you've been on this last year? in particular so January the end of January of this year I was diagnosed with stage 4 colon cancer that spread to my liver we had no signs nothing I didn't have any pain and quickly though they got me into surgery to remove the cancer out of my colon but then they told me for sure I would have to do chemo so in March I started chemo for six months and it was a very rough time physically emotionally spiritually mentally and I just had to put one foot in front of the other and just continue to ask God to give me the strength to get through my day because I didn't know what chemo would do to my body I was told it could make me weak I would be tired I might have a bunch of side effects but something in me just knew that God was going to work through this and be my healer. Mm. And so even on the dark days where I would be in pain in my bed, I still would just say, I would just look up and just say, God, you're my healer. Mm. I don't know how. I don't know when. And I thought for sure after six months, I would be done. Mm. And then we found out that the tumors were still there. They had shrunk so much by the end of August, but they were still there. And so I recently, about a month ago, I started more chemo. It's less hard on my body, I would say, because I'm not having to go in every week to go get chemotherapy. Um, and so I just continue to trust God. I feel like I've been born into a family of faith and God. And so I just, I hold to my family and to my church. And you guys have all been so kind to me through it all. I don't know what I would do without my community and without prayer from you and your wife and all of City Church, I just feel so blessed that even though people aren't walking what I'm walking, you're walking alongside with me. And so if I feel like I'm gonna fall, there's somebody there to catch me. And I don't know where I would be without God and his word and prayer and people and encouragement. And even in the middle of all of that, God would ask me to go encourage people. And you would think, I'm the one that needs the encouragement. Tell, tell them a bit about uh, when you go to chemo, you have a particular ritual every time. What oh. do you do? Okay, I love Disneyland. Okay, so our house, it's Jesus and Disneyland or Mickey Mouse. And so <laughs> I told myself, I'm gonna do chemo, I'm gonna do it my way. So I wear a different pair of Minnie Mouse ears. Every time I go in, and of course, at first, people kind of gave me some weird looks, some of the patients, but the nurses loved it. And so they would come by, what, what ears are you wearing today? And I was so excited. I thought, you know, I'm just kind of being silly because it brings me some joy, but I had no idea that it would bless the nurses. And goodness, like for them to be able to walk a pandemic, and know that I could bring a little joy to them, I would always walk away even after a long chemo session and just say, Lord, thank you for letting me be a light today. Mm. And it was like, I didn't dread it as much. Of course, nobody wants to go to chemotherapy, yeah. but when you know that God's gonna get to use your story and use the hard stuff mm. for his glory, I mean, I'll take one for the team. It's not something anybody should have to walk through. For sure, not at my age. You would think colon cancer, a 50, 60 year old. I'm in my late thirties. Yeah. And this happened. Yeah. But God had a plan and it's not my plan. But when I surrender to his plan, 
then he can do amazing things. And I've seen nurses smile mm. and offer prayer or tell me, I prayed for you last week mm. and I would have a hard week. And how would they know? But they just knew, they knew God. And so it's just so cool to see how God can take something really awful mm. and make it beautiful. That's and amazing. it's a way that I can point people to Jesus even if they don't accept him right at that moment how cool it is that i'm planting seeds someone else can water and someone else can harvest i don't have to do it all but it's actually trying to take the time to say okay god what do you want and it's not why me this happens to me because at first i was like why me lord this is not right but later it changed to why not me because why not me? Why not me have to walk cancer? Anybody is gonna deal with stuff hard in their life, but if you change your perspective of why not me, then God can really use it. But it's an attitude change. It's a shift of perspective. It's seeing God and saying, I know who you are. You are true, you are real. Like, I didn't just grow up in a nice church and go to Sunday school. I learned through this that God really is who He says He is. And we have to find hope and faith in our journey. And it's not easy, but I just have to say, God is the one who gets you through it. And He brings people to help you. So I'm very grateful. Even though I'm still walking it, He has the perfect time for me to be healed. And yeah. until then, I'm just gonna be positive and just, all I want to be is a light for him. That's I want amazing. people to see me, and when they see me, see him. That's amazing. Um, and I can say that's certainly been true from everything I've seen. Um, you know, what are some of the things in this last year that have helped you balance the stress of 2020 <laughs> uh, with the stress of your own situation? You know, the world has gone through a crisis, but you're going through one too. So what are some things that have helped you balance that and find hope in the midst of it? Uh, for me, it's taking time out, like by myself, to just be alone. Uh, I have a husband and a daughter, and so it's just getting away to my room and to have that peace and quiet. Um, and also worship music is huge for me. If I'm having a rough day, I let myself have a little pity party for a few minutes, but then I turn on worship music because it will help me shift that so I don't go down a rabbit hole. Yeah. I want to be able to say, okay, I'm human, I feel this way, but Lord, please come into my life and help what's going on be okay. Help me to be able to give it to you. And yeah. worship music has been incredible. And I'm telling you, I feel like even though the world is going through a pandemic, songwriters are writing incredible songs for God. And yes. it's just been powerful. And then finally his word. If we don't have his word, I don't feel like we actually can know who he is. Mm -hmm. And so when I struggle, maybe I don't feel like I have a lot of strength. I remember Philippians 4.13, mm -hmm. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I do it because he gives me the strength. It's not my own strength. Yeah. My own strength is going to get me only so far. But with his strength, I can exceed that. Mm. And so having his word is so powerful. And it's not just reading it and skimming it, it's reading it and meditating, stopping and going, what does God really say from this Bible verse or this mm. chapter? So that's been very helpful for me. That's so awesome. I mean, just, we all should, the longer we walk with God should know that. And yeah. you know, you are taught those things, but it's amazing to hear like, you know, that in the midst of what you're going through that you're just really clinging to that. And uh, I think there's a lesson in there for all of us to, to think about. Let me ask you a question. How would you have defined hope a year ago and how would you define it today? Uh, hope a year ago, probably. I never see hope as silly, but maybe I would see it as, you know, just something I think could happen. You know, that would be hope a year ago. Hope now is I believe the best in, I believe the best for a situation, even if the situation is not great. So I got not great news recently. And, but I said, it doesn't matter. I still have hope 
in yes. Christ that even though that's the news I get, my hope is I think the best for that situation. So Lord, you're still my healer, even though this is the news I have. Yes. So it's learning to be able to say, God, I don't like this situation, but yes. it's a situation. He still is good. He still is ho hope. Mm -hmm. Our situation may not be great, but he's still good. They're not, they don't go hand in hand. They're two separate things. Mm -hmm. So it's really important that we don't say, oh, I'm going through a tough time, so God's not good. No, God is good Amen. regardless of the situation. So regardless of COVID, regardless of cancer, regardless of whatever you go through, you have to be able to say, that's a situation, but my God is still good. And my God is still on the throne. And if we don't understand that and be able to separate the two, then I don't really feel like you can find hope. Amen. Because you will lean on the side of reality, which is okay. Yes. It's okay to have the reality of it, but we've got to have hope and faith too. Yes. And I lean more towards the hope and faith. I lean more towards the, it's going to be okay, even though it's not okay. Yes. Because, hey, God has the final say. He not a does. doctor, not a medicine, not anything. God has the final say. And so if I say, God, my hope is in you, I can say, give me whatever news you want. Go at me, devil, come on. I got my shield of faith up today. But God, you get the final say. And you did it on the cross. Hmm. If you did it on the cross, it's finished. Amen. So why am I going to sit here and try to fight a battle that's already been won. He won it. He won my healing. Even before I'm healed, he won it. So we have to be able to understand he's good no matter what, no matter what. I love that. Just hope, believing the best in the situation you find yourself in. That is just so good. And something that even for myself this year, I, I need to think about more. Would you have any final words of encouragement that you would want to share with someone going through something, struggling to find hope in their own life? Sure, I would love to. Go ahead and share. I just want to say no matter what you're walking through, one, you're loved. You're loved by God. You're loved by people. Two, you are important. You were born for a purpose. You have a story. You have a reason to live, a reason to get up today. You have air in your lungs and you can walk. So get up and do something for him. Put a smile on your face even if you don't feel like it because I'm telling you, if you fake it for a while, it'll start to show up real. <laughs> so it. keep going, persevere, put one foot in front of the other and reach out to community, people. You need people that love God and love you to pray for you, to encourage you. You are so loved. May you feel God's love today and always. No matter what Christmas looks like this year, may we remember that a Savior was born for us, for you, specifically for you to know Him and to have salvation. May you have hope this Christmas. It may not come from a Christmas tree or food or decorations, but it come from Jesus. He loves you. He loves you. If he loves me, he loves you. So why not today? Make a choice if you don't know him to ask for his salvation into your heart. Reach out and you are amazing. I love you and I can't wait to tell you that I am healed. And when I am, I get no glory. He gets it all. I'm so grateful for you. I love you. Amen. Well, I would like to pray for you. And you. Uh, hey, wherever you're watching this right now, pray for Melissa and her journey and everything that she's going through. So let's, let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for Melissa. We thank you for her hope. And we thank you, Lord, that it's not pie in the sky. It is real. And it is as real as the air we're breathing and the ground we're standing on. Uh, it's as real as you are, Lord, because hope is found in you. And so we thank you for that. And right now, Lord, I, we all just want to pray, Lord, for Melissa's complete healing. God, we pray that from 
head to toe, top to bottom, inside and out. You would cause every cell in her body to respond in healing the way that you have designed it to. And so, Lord, we just pray that these doctors would have great wisdom, that the medicines would take effect. Uh, Lord, we pray that you would give her strength to get through these treatments. I pray for her family, for her husband Nathan and sweet little Emma and everything they're dealing with this year. Uh, Lord, infuse them all with hope and and with purpose, and we pray for just a, a miraculous healing in her life. We'll believe you for it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Melissa. Thank you. I hope you have a Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Man, what an amazing testimony. I almost just wanted to make that the message today and just put a period on it, sing a song and say go home, but I'm a preacher and I had something to say. So (laughs) my message title today is Hope in Uncertain Times. You know, last week, Pastor Willie opened up our Christmas Advent series, and technically today is the third Sunday of Advent. Uh, We usually don't follow kind of a traditional calendar in terms of preaching around here at City Church, but Christmas is one of those times when it's nice to go back to the classic stories in our Bibles about the Lord's birth, and so we're preaching through some of those Christmas stories right now. Last week, we saw the story of the Magi who wholeheartedly uh, found Jesus and responded to him with everything they had. It's always a challenge to keep preaching fresh during Christmas and Easter for most pastors because there really aren't that many biblical texts to actually draw from. And at the same time, I also know that God's word can pierce our hearts in a fresh way on a different day with the story we've looked at many, many times before. And so my prayer is that that would be what happens today for you. My guess is that you've probably read the text that we're going to look at today, but I suspect you may not have spent a whole lot of time focusing on it before. So I'd like to invite you to open up a Bible to Luke chapter 2, and we're going to focus today on verses 22 through 38, and specifically 36 to 38 in a minute. Uh, But go ahead and open a Bible there, Uh, whether you got a physical Bible or you want to do it on your phone, uh, you can do it that way as well on the YouVersion app. And to give you a little bit of context into what's happening as you turn and swipe there. Here's what's going on. We're making a big jump forward in terms of the actual Christmas timeline. And at this point that we're picking up the story in Luke, baby Jesus has already been born. The shepherds have already visited. And what we're going to see today is essentially Jesus's Jewish baby dedication. And Jewish custom and law as as outlined in Exodus 13 and, and Leviticus 12 determines that several events needed to happen when a baby was born. Uh, and for a baby boy, there were even more specific instructions given. And if it was a firstborn male, there was even another layer to it. We're going to look more at what those are in just a moment. Uh, But what we're going to read today is the story of Joseph and Mary obediently doing everything God's word required as they presented Jesus to God the Father. And before we get into it, let me just say this. Today we are living in incredibly uncertain times. No doubt about it. But let me give you a glimpse into the uncertain times that Joseph and Mary were living through at this point in biblical history. Shortly after Mary first found out that she was pregnant, she had to flee to the hill country of Judea because of social pressure uh, from what was perceived to be a pregnancy that was out of wedlock. After a few months, Mary went home. And once she got home, a census got called for her to return to her hometown to be registered. And during a time when I would imagine she would have preferred to be keeping her feet up and getting massages over at the day spa, Mary had to hop on the back of a donkey to make the long, uncomfortable trek all the way to her hometown, Bethlehem. And when they got there, all the local hotels were completely full and she had no choice but to give birth in a barn. Talk about a rough road. Politically, things were uncertain. There was the daily battle between the Roman governing authorities and the Jewish leadership and ordinary people often just got caught in the middle of the conflict. And shortly after the text that we're gonna read today, Mary will have to uh, face a huge threat. Mary will face a huge threat to Jesus's life again and be forced to flee, but this time all the way to Egypt. So Joseph and Mary trusted and obeyed God through tremendously uncertain times. And as we read these verses today, 
I pray that we find some glimpses into what it means for us to find hope in the uncertain times that we're facing. So I'm going to pray right now, and I would invite you to bow your head and your heart in your home or wherever you're watching this right now. Father God, we thank you for your word. We thank you, God, that you are our hope in uncertain times. And I pray today that everyone watching this would get a glimpse and a glimmer of your hope for our lives today. Speak to us, open our eyes to see what you want us to see, open our ears to hear what you want us to hear, and open our hearts that we would respond and become the disciples that Jesus wants us to be. And it's in his name we pray, amen. I'll go ahead and read Luke 2, 22 through 24. It says this, and when the time came for their purification according to the law of Moses, they brought him up to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord as it is written in the law of the Lord. Every male who first opens the womb shall be called holy to the Lord and offer a sacrifice according to what is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. So we'll go ahead and we'll push pause there for right now. So Mary and Joseph dedicated Jesus to God and made the offering that was allotted for poor folks in this passage. Um, this gives us a little bit of a glimpse into both their obedience and into the life that Jesus was born into. You know, the king of kings here was born into a humble yet obedient family. So today I want to look at what it looks like. For us to live a hope-filled life in uncertain times. And so there's a few things I'd love for you to write down if you want to take notes and follow along in that way. And the first thing I'd love for you to write down is this. A hope-filled life has a trademark of daily obedience. Mary and Joseph obeyed every aspect of the Jewish law as a way of life. They didn't have certain days when they did them and certain days where they decided certain things didn't apply. No, this was a daily way of living for this family. I mentioned that we'd look more into the things required by the Jewish law with respect to dedicating a child to the Lord. There were three elements of a dedication in the Old Testament. And, and the first, if it was a boy, was the painful act of circumcision. The second one uh, was that a financial offering had to be made. And so here we see Joseph and Mary put God first in every area of their lives and includes that includes this one about their finances. So they made a financial offering. And the third element that we see here is that if the child was a firstborn male, it included the consecration of the firstborn to God the Father. Uh, now leave a thumb in the book of Luke and go all the way to the left in your Bible to the second book of Exodus, which we've actually been in a series going through and we've pushed pause on. We're going to go back to it in the new year. Uh, but go ahead and turn to Exodus chapter 13 and we're going to look at verses 1 through 16 where it actually unpacks these things and what's supposed to take place. Um, and so what I'm going to do is I'm going to read the different areas where the Lord said he wanted to be first. Uh, so here is what the book of Exodus says about the consecration of the firstborn. Exodus 13, 1 and 2. We'll start there. It says, The Lord said to Moses, Consecrate to me all the firstborn. Whatever is the first to open the womb among the people of Israel of both man and beast is mine. God wanted the first of everything. Now jump down to verse 11 and it gets more specifically into all of it. It says, when the Lord brings you into the land of the Canaanites as he swore to you and your fathers and shall give it to you, you shall set apart to the Lord all that first opens the womb. All the firstborn of your animals that are males shall be the Lord's. Every firstborn of a donkey you shall redeem with the lamb, or if you shall not redeem, or if you will not redeem it, uh, you shall break its neck. Every firstborn of a man among your sons you shall redeem. And when in time uh, to come your son asks you, what does this mean? You shall say to him, by a strong hand the Lord brought us out of Egypt from the house of slavery. For when Pharaoh stubbornly refused to let us go, the Lord killed all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both the firstborn of man and the firstborn of animals. Therefore, I sacrifice to the Lord all the males that first opened the womb, but all the firstborn of my sons I redeem. It shall be as a mark on your hand or frontlets between your eyes, for by a strong hand the Lord brought us out 
of Egypt. So God says every first son from the womb belonged to the Lord, both animal and human. Um, and practically, this meant sacrificing the animals and giving the firstborn male over to a life of service in the temple. Uh, so first, uh, the first donkey and, and uh, was was sacrificed. You see, that's even put in there. And if if they could afford a land, that could be a substitute. Um, and so let me stop right here to remind all of us about something. See, God has always and will always want to be the first and the best from every one of us. He wants the first and he wants the best. Um, it's one of the reasons that we give to the Lord off the top of our finances. You know, we don't give to God out of our leftovers or we're not supposed to. That's what the Bible says. Uh, God says that we're to give the first and the best out of our lives. And you know, tithing is this principle of, of the first tenth of our income that goes to God. And it's not something that we have to to do. It's something that we get to do. We get to worship God in this unique way, and God will reward it beyond what we will ever understand. Uh, now, personally, for me, giving my 10% to the Lord would be is a lot easier uh, than if God asked me to surrender my firstborn son <laughs> to the Lord. I will tell you that definitively. I have a firstborn son, and I love him with all my heart. And I want nothing more than for Nigel to serve the Lord in ministry ministry one day. And, but there is no universe where I would want to give Nigel over to grow up in some boarding school where he was raised by priests during his entire childhood. Now, I don't think I could give my child up like that. I want Nigel to grow up with us. Um, and Jewish parents probably would have considered it a great honor to give their kids over to the service of the priesthood and of the Lord. But there's no doubt it would also have been a mass of sacrifice. Okay, so here's the really cool thing that God does in this whole thing. In his mercy, God provided a substitute so that this would not have to be the case in every situation. I'm specifically referring to giving your firstborn uh, to the temple service for your, their whole life. Um, what God did is God later provided the whole tribe of Levi to be the temple workers instead. We see this in Numbers 3, 11 through 13. And, and some Jewish parents may have still opted to give their firstborn to the Lord and to the temple service in this way. Uh, maybe they were like really fed up with their kids around that house and they're like, here priests, you take them. I don't know. Uh, hopefully that wasn't the reason. I'm pretty sure it probably wasn't for most of them. But as a part of dedicating the firstborn male in the temple, what these families would be doing was they would take their firstborn son with the knowledge that this child actually belonged to the Lord. And, and they would be taking them with the mindset that were it not for the substitute that the Lord was providing, they wouldn't be coming home with their child that day. And then they would make their financial sacrifice and their offering as a reminder of their forgiveness of sins for sure, but also as an offering of gratitude for the substitute of the Levites that allowed them to take their child to return home with them that day. What a blessing that must have been. And the idea was a little bit like the story of Abraham and Isaac on the top of Mount Moriah, if you can picture it in your head. And right at that moment, where uh, uh, Abraham was about to put that knife into Isaac's chest. The Lord says, don't do it. I've provided a substitute. And they see this ram caught in a thicket nearby and they sacrifice the ram instead. So the whole ceremony of presenting the firstborn male to the Lord in the temple carried all of these ideas with it. And Joseph and Mary obediently presented Jesus in the temple uh, to give their child back to the Lord. Guys, I believe obedience is the only way to find lasting hope in this life, no matter how hard the sacrifice may seem or feel at the time. We may all find things that make us feel temporarily hopeful, but only obedience offers lasting hope in this life. And obedience and hope are inseparable. The very best that this world has to offer is a fleeting glimpse of hope that is going to quickly fade away when the next crisis or tragedy strikes in the world or in your life. Lasting hope on this side of eternity starts with daily obedience. And obedience isn't just like doing what we're told or being good boys and good girls. See, obedience is so much more than that. It's a willing response of the heart where we actually want 
what God the Father wants for us because we know and we trust that he loves us and that his heart for us is truly good. And once we know what obedience looks like in a certain situation, we have two choices. We can submit to it or we can rebel and go the other way. There's no middle ground when it comes to obedience. And so when we go the other way and we go our own way, what we're choosing to do is to build our lives on what Jesus might have referred to as shifting sand rather than on the solid rock that is gonna bring lasting hope that we so desperately need. See, hope springs from the solid foundation of a life built on the rock of Jesus through the vessel of obedience. And obedience means God wants to be absolutely first in everything in our lives. And this super cool thing happens when we sacrifice the first to God and the best of our lives. God provides a substitute. It's what he does. A hope-filled life looks expectantly for those divine substitutions to come. And God provided the Levites as the substitute for those families who were giving up their firstborn son. In Exodus 13, it mentions all these other areas where uh, God substitutes things that were sacrificed. Uh, God provided the lamb as a substitute for offering the family donkey. God provided a substitute for the Jewish firstborn males in Egypt uh, to, to survive the Exodus. And that was the blood of the lamb on the door post that was there. And of course, all this is just a foreshadowing of the fact that God would one day provide a substitute for our sins at the cross, his one and only son, Jesus. Colossians 1 15 says, Jesus is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. Now, for Jesus to be called the firstborn doesn't mean that he had a beginning as we are. Jesus is eternal. Uh, What is more broadly being referred to here is Jesus's preeminence over everything. So bringing it full circle here, the sacrifice that Joseph and Mary were making in Luke 2, 22 to 24, by dedicating Jesus, their firstborn, was a way of foreshadowing the fact that Jesus was really God's firstborn over all creation who would be the perfect substitute to redeem the world and to stand in the place of our sins so that we could then stand in the presence of the heavenly father. What a cool connection. You know, the cool, there's the connections between the book of Exodus and uh, that we've just pushed pause on and Jesus's story are actually really incredible. They're all over the place. God loves to substitute divine blessing for sacrificial obedience. It's all over scripture. And so daily sacrificial obedience is the true mark of every believer's life. Obedience was what defined Joseph and Mary's lives. Obedience defined Jesus's whole life and it paved the way for him to go through with accomplishing his mission at the cross even when he didn't feel like it. And and Jesus sent the Holy Spirit to dwell in us so that obedience could define our lives. Obedience means God wants to be first. God wants to be first in our finances. God wants to be first in our marriages. God wants to be first in our friendships. God wants to be first in our sex life. God wants to be first in how we act at work. God wants to be first in how we respond to other people. God wants to be first in our thought life. God wants to be first in our time. God wants to be first first. It sounds really nice to say that as a Christian, but you know, the practical reality of putting God first means making daily decisions of obedience that are often sacrificial to pave the way for lasting hope. And so this daily obedience is what we saw in Jesus's parents. It's what we saw in Jesus, and it is still what leads to lasting hope today. So back to the text in Luke. Right after this, Joseph and Mary, they get to the temple, they present Jesus, and then this guy named Simeon comes and he sees Jesus. It's a great story. I'm actually not going to read that story because of time today, but basically Simeon was the super godly guy uh, who had been told by the Lord that he would encounter the Messiah before he died, and that's exactly what happened. And during Simeon's encounter with baby Jesus, this prophetess named Anna comes along and she witnesses it, and 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 then she adds more to the story. And so this is the part actually that I want to go ahead and focus on today. So go ahead and go back to the book of Luke. And now we're going to pick it up in verse 36. And this is where we're going to spend the rest of our time right now. Luke 2, uh, 36 says this. And there was a prophetess, Anna, the daughter of Phanuel of the tribe 
of Asher. She was advanced in years, having lived with her husband seven years from when she was a virgin, and then as a widow until she was 84. She did not depart from the temple, worshiping with fasting and prayer night and day. And coming up at that very hour, she began to give thanks to God and to speak of him to all who were waiting for the redemption of Jerusalem. So let me unpack a few things from what we just read to you. Anna got seven years with her husband, and then he died. And she spent the rest of her life as a widow. Now talk about a painful road for anyone to walk. And in the ancient world, there was a provision to care for widows. One of them was called uh, levirate marriage, where a close relative could marry the widow and, and take them into their home and care for them for the rest of their life. And when that didn't happen, uh, what often happened is that widows were left to resort to ungodly means to make a living. Well, Obviously, no one came along to rescue Anna in that way. And so at that moment in Anna's life, or probably that year or season in her life, Anna had a choice. She could do it her way, or she could do it God's way. And Anna chose a different path. She chose to do it God's way. Rather than devoting herself to the ways of the world, she devoted herself to the ways of God's word. She devoted herself to being a woman of worship and a woman of prayer. And she spent her life searching for God's presence and for God's purpose in the midst of her life's pain. And she found her purpose in Jesus. And, and she got to participate in this moment in biblical history at Jesus' dedication here. And so this takes me to the next thing that I would like to, you to write down about how to lead a hope-filled life. A hope-filled life is constantly searching for God's presence and God's purpose in life's pain. So Anna lost her husband and she made the decision to serve and to trust God for the rest of her life. You know, there are some things that happen in life that are so painful that we often can't even begin to think about how we'll ever recover from them. It can be a, a tragedy, uh, like an illness uh, or, or a death in the family. It can be the loss of a job. It can be the souring of a really good friendship that you had. It can be infidelity in a marriage. It can be the end of a relationship that you thought was absolutely the one. Uh, it, it can be so many different things. But pain is a part of the fallen world that we live in. And in her pain, Anna made a decision. She decided to devote herself to serving God and to the work of ministry. And the text tells us she did not depart from the temple. I love that little phrase. It basically meant that from that point on, she was in the temple all the time. And, and you know, at that time, the temple was the closest place place to the presence of God that a person could possibly be. So in other words, when Anna's world fell apart, she clung to the one who holds the world. You know, I like to think of it this way. Anna was kind of like the quintessential, like quote unquote, church lady, you know? <laughs> she was at every small group Bible study. She was at every prayer gathering. She was at every service. She listened to the same sermon three or four times from the pastor. She showed up to every baby dedication. She showed up to every meeting. Even the meetings that she wasn't invited to, she showed up to those also. You know, if there was something happening at the church, Anna was going to be there. And, and think about this for a minute. Anna blessed a family who was dedicating their child to the Lord. She could very well have avoided every child dedication in the temple because it would have been a painful reminder of her own dead husband and B, the fact that she never had kids. So she could have just, every time she heard there was a baby dedication, just stayed away. But you know what? She chose not to do that. Instead, Anna decided to view her pain through the lens of the hope of God. And because she chose to live a hope-filled life, God blessed Anna with seeing the Messiah, Christ Jesus, the firstborn over all creation, the one who would be the substitute for all of our sin, who all of Israel was waiting to be redeemed from or because of. See, Anna was constantly searching for God's presence and God's purpose in her life's pain. 
Painful life circumstances offer all of us a choice. We can succumb to the pain of life or we can search for the presence and the power and the purpose of God in the midst of it. And the Bible tells us that Anna only got seven short years with her husband. Now, assuming she was a teenager, young teenager, which she probably would have been when she got married, uh, she probably lived over 60 years as a widow. And every single day she woke up, she would have had the choice. She could dwell on her pain and the misery of losing her spouse uh, and the fact that she never had a family of her own, or she could sit in the presence of the Lord and worship him for the rest of her life. And Anna chose to be with God and God blessed her accordingly. Church, life is especially tough these days. We're all sick of what we're dealing with. We're more stressed than we've ever been in many cases. And I think we could all use a fresh dose of hope going into 2021. And what I'm talking about is not a wishy-washy New Year's greeting or wish. What I'm talking about is a hope-filled life. So what does that look like? Well, for today, I think it starts with taking our eyes off the pain and the suffering in this world and in our lives and searching for the power and the presence of God in this moment right now. You know, some of you might need to fast. It says that Anna was amazing at fasting in the temple and, and this was a huge part of her life. I'll be honest with you for a minute here. I'm always honest, but extra honest, okay? I'm not good at fasting at all. Uh, I, I think all of us, could learn a lesson in there. I think all of us could spend more time worshiping God. I think all of us could spend more time reading our Bibles. I think all of us could spend a little more time seeking the face of God. And, and maybe for some of you, it might not be as much about an amount of minutes on your calendar or, or your, your sheet of things you're doing that day. Maybe for you, it's more of a constant awareness of the presence of God being with you and a constant pursuit of him in daily life. See, Anna sought God and she found her her purpose in him despite her life's pain. When I think about Melissa, whose interview we just watched right before this message, I really see an example of Anna's obedience. I see someone who is choosing to live with hope despite circumstances that scream for sadness and depression. And Melissa also isn't unaware of the realities facing her, but she is choosing to seek God's presence and his purpose in her current pain. I think that's the choice that God would want for every single one of us today. So let me ask you the question for you to think about in the quietness of your home or wherever you are right now. How are you seeking God in your pain right now? A hope-filled life is constantly searching for God's presence and for God's purpose in their pain. Take a left in your Bible to the big book in the middle, the book of Psalms, and turn to chapter 130. And I want to read together Psalm 130 verses 5 and 6. This is what it says. It says, I wait for the Lord. My soul waits, and in his word I hope my soul waits for the Lord more than watchmen for the morning, more than watchmen for the morning. You know, a watchman's whole job is simply to keep their eyes open and peeled on the horizon as they await that sun to come up in the distance. And once that dark blue uh, slash black sky begins to crack into purples and, and ambers and, and light blues, finally into a full-blown dawn, the job of a watchman for the night was accomplished. See, if an enemy was going to come, it was probably going to be during the nighttime to keep the element of surprise. And so their whole job was to stay up all night to keep everyone else in the city safe. And they would watch as they waited for dawn to break expectantly. And that dawn, when it would break, it meant hope. And so what God is telling us through this psalm in his word is that God wants you and I to be watchmen and watch women in the night with the word of God giving us hope in the darkness as we await the morning to break. You know, we're continuing to search for hope even in the dark of the night when the dawn is a long, long ways away. 
And God's plan is never for his people to dwell in, ministry, uh, in misery. Uh, God's plan is for his people uh, to have a hope and to have a future. Uh, see, I want to encourage you today to keep searching for the presence and the purpose of God in your pain that you're dealing with. It's one of the keys to a hope filled life. And so a hope filled life is constantly searching uh, for the power and the presence of God in the, in the pain that we're dealing with in life. Here's the third thing that I want you to know about what a hope filled life looks like. A hope filled life will be noticeable and it must be shared. In verse 38, it says that Anna shared the hope of Jesus with everyone who was there. I believe true hope from the Lord is obvious and people naturally want to share it. First Peter 3.15 says, but in your hearts honor the Lord, uh, Christ the Lord is holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you, yet do it with gentleness and respect. And you know, I love in that verse that it's not share all the knowledge that you have about Bible and all... The things you've read in, 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 uh, in, in books and, and things like that, those are great. They have an awesome purpose. But the thing that's actually going to draw somebody else to the Lord Jesus Christ is the hope that is in you. And so Peter says the most important thing that you could ever do in your life is to share the hope that's in you. And when hope is in you, you naturally want to share it. There is a reason for the hope that is in you and it is Jesus. Years ago, there was a Gatorade marketing slogan that many of you have probably heard uh, that asked the question, is it in you? And what these marketers were trying to do was to appeal to the determination of these hardcore athletes with this intrinsic sense of self-discipline. And they were trying to tie that sense of self-discipline to these athletes drinking their sugary recovery drinks, which if you actually thinking about, think about it, it's, it's kind of funny. Uh, but Frankly, I think the connection is made much more strongly when it comes to the topic of hope. See, the more that we see Jesus, the more we will see hope. The more we obey Jesus, the more we will experience hope. We will build our lives on a lasting foundation. And if he is in us, others will notice it. And they will seek out the reason for the hope that is in you. So, is he in you? Hope is either in you or it's not. And if Jesus is in you, hope is in you. And when he brings hope into you, it's going to come out. And a hope-filled life will be noticeable and it must be shared. Just like Anna shared it with everyone who was there, the same thing is gonna come in opportunities in your life. So I leave you with the question about hope this Christmas. Is it in you? Let's pray. Jesus, we thank you for your hope. We thank you for your love. We thank you that you are present with us in our pain. I ask right here and right now, Lord, that you would give us a sense of your working in our lives. God, help us to take our eyes off of our pain and to place them upon you, our hope. We love you, and it's in your name we pray. Amen.